So hey, if this is your uh, first time at Salt Church, welcome. My name is Michael. I'm the lead pastor, and I don't know how to turn my microphone on. Uh, so hey, if this is your very first time ever visiting us, uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, I didn't know first service what the worship team was doing. I was like, where are you guys going? Uh, so I just might float away mid-sermon and preach from the back. So we'll see what happens. Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to James chapter 5. That's where we are going to be hanging out this morning, uh, continuing our Gospel Culture series. Uh, One quick announcement. Uh, So coming up on Sunday, November 14th, which is a couple weeks, three weeks from today, uh, we have Baptism Sunday. So it'll be our third time we've done Baptism Sunday here at Salt Church. Uh, It's an awesome, awesome time. We set up this massive horse trough and baptize people in it. If you've never been baptized, if you're a Christian, we do believer's baptism. We believe that baptism should come after you're a Christian. If you've never been baptized, we would love to baptize you on November 14th. Uh, So again, this does nothing to save you. There's nothing magic in the water. It's a public profession of an inward faith. Uh, If you have never been baptized before, we'd love to do that on the 14th. So here's what you do. Uh, You could go to saltchurchaz.com slash baptism, or you could go to Connect Central and tell them you want to get baptized. What that's going to do, it's going to make you get in contact with me, and then I'll sit down, grab coffee or lunch with you, go through everything, Uh, but we'd love to do that. That's coming up in three weeks, so don't delay. If that's something you've been wanting to do for a while, uh, let us know ASAP, because that's a little bit of a process. Uh, So that is baptism, three weeks from today. So Anyway, transparency is what we're talking about today. Uh, Week two of our Gospel Culture series. Last week we talked about how we are to be a people that are filled with love and grace. Uh, This week we're talking about something that's a little more difficult to discuss, and that's transparency. And it's having transparency before God, and it's having transparency before each other. Uh, So for our text this morning, we're going to be in James chapter 5, very end of the book of James. It's the last thing he says in this book. Uh, James is one of my favorite books in the, in the Bible. It's one of the more practical books uh, out there. And this whole text that we're covering this morning has to do with prayer, uh, but it also has a lot to do with our relationship with God and how we relate to each other as believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, so let's just jump right in. James chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Uh, James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So we see right away what's going on here. Uh, James asks, are you suffering? Well, if you're suffering, what do you do? He tells you a command. He says, you should pray. Let him pray. You run to God. Uh, I guess a quick question to ask yourself is, does your prayer life match the suffering in your life? Or better yet, the suffering that right now you're actually going through. And I say that because uh, if you haven't picked up on it yet, we're pretty serious about prayer. Like prayer is the foundation of who we are as a church. We're always encouraging you to, to pray with us, to fill out prayer requests. I've got prayer requests in my pocket right now. Uh, those prayer requests get dropped in the box. They give, they're given to my admin and then they're given to me. And what happens is I print those all off on an Excel spreadsheet and I pray over those requests in my office every single day. I want to make sure you all know that your prayer needs are met, not just by me, but by our staff, by our prayer team. But I say suffering because I know some of you are suffering right now. Why do I know that? Because I read the prayer requests. Just last week, we had prayer requests uh, of someone whose spouse has left the house, uh, people who deal with addiction day in and day out, uh, addiction that's plagued them for a long time, people with wayward kids that have left. They don't want anything to do with the church, and you're praying that they would somehow come back into the fold. There's some of you in this room that are suffering right now. So the question is, does your prayer life match that level of suffering. And my question is, do you ever get real with God? Do you ever have real prayers with God? Uh, This happened to me a couple weeks ago. We had a lot of stuff happening on our prayer team, a lot of people on our prayer team getting sick, uh, all kinds of stuff going on. And one of the leaders of our prayer team, his name's Bill, uh, he was just plagued with a lot of health issues, just a lot of stuff happening with his spine, uh, kidney stones, just could barely stand up. No position he was in was ever comfortable. Teaches Financial Peace University here. And I'll never forget, a few weeks ago, I was just driving home, dropped my son off at school, and I'm just praying like I normally do on the way home. And I just prayed to God. I'm like, God, why don't you heal Bill? Like, what's the deal? Like, Bill's faithful to you. He's faithful to the church. He he does everything that a Christian should do. 
and yet he's still plagued with like all this stuff going on. And I just wanted to know from God, like, why aren't you healing him? Do you ever have prayers like that to God? You know, do you ever read the Psalms? And I talk about this a lot. David's like schizophrenic. One Psalm, he's just like, God, you're the best. Next Psalm, he's like, God, I don't even know where you're at. Where are you? Do you have prayers like that? Where you're asking the Lord, you're pleading on your own behalf or somebody else's behalf. Do you make your desires known before the Lord? Because if you're in the midst of suffering, what does James tell us here? The first person you should run to is God. So if you're suffering, you should pray. And then the next thing he says, if you're cheerful, you should sing praise. And James isn't referring to like that awkward neighbor who's always happy, the guy that you'd like to slap upside the head. He's talking about your inward presence, your inward peace of mind, an inward sense of contentment, that things are probably going well for you. I don't want to always put it out there like all of you are in this deep, dark suffering. Some of you are like, man, Michael, my life, I'm killing it right now. And that's awesome. But here's the deal. All this stuff happens, and James is telling you, if you're in the midst of goodness, sing praise to the Lord. And that verb, sing praise, denotes continuous action, that you should continuously praise the Lord. You should continuously sing praises to him. It should be a posture of what your life looks like. Does your life actually look like that? And so what do I notice in verse 13? That's transparency with God, whether things are going well or things are going really, really poorly. It's letting him know that you're suffering. It's letting him know that things are going well. You know, I look at my life. I'm busy. I'm all over the place with meetings and stuff like that. I I look at the rhythms of my day, and I try to stop at multiple times throughout my day to just simply thank God for where I'm at. Maybe I left a hard meeting or a hard phone call. Maybe things are going well. Just to thank the Lord for the rhythms of my life and what he's doing in my life. It's a continual relationship you should have with him. Whether you're suffering, you should pray. Whether you're doing well, you should sing praise. It's one-on-one transparency before the Lord. But then we notice here in verse 14 that the tone shifts from transparency with God to transparency with people in the church. It says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So what does James mean by sick? For those of you who are sick, he's talking about like a physical illness, like you're physically sick. Uh, You have some sort of physical condition on your body where you're ill. He's telling you to go to the elders of the church and go get prayer for that. Uh, But what is he telling the elders? That you should pray over the sick. You should literally stand over the sick and pray for the sick. Uh, The worst part of my job, and I've 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 gotten to do this five times since this church started, uh, where I've prayed over somebody's bedside when they're about to go be with the Lord. James tells us, if you're sick, go get prayer. Go to the elders of the church to go get prayer. And this church doesn't have elders. We're 10 months old. We're going to candidate elders in January. We report to the elders of Desert Springs. That's how the the operation works here at Salt Church. But at this point in time, I take this verse, and we do have men and women on the prayer team that are people who will pray over you in a mature way. So what do you do if you're sick? Uh, You go get prayer. If there's one part of the culture of Salt Church that I could change, it's that prayer sign over there. That's not there just to be there. That's there so whether you're sitting right next to it or you're all the way sitting over here, that if you have a need in prayer, that you would walk across the auditorium and get prayed for. There's power in prayer. There's healing in prayer. And at the end of the day, those people aren't elders, but those are men and women who pray over there that are spiritually mature. We're not grabbing people out of the lobby like, hey, can you stand at the prayer sign? And if anybody comes up, just happen to lobby a prayer in their way. Those are trusted people that keep things confidential. At the end of the day, you have to believe that there's power in prayer. There's power in transparency. If you truly believe that, you'd get prayed over if things weren't going your way. You would go on our Wednesday night prayer meeting in a living room, and you would get prayed over. You would participate in the events that we have for prayer. So that's what the sick should do. The sick should call the elders of the church. You should come find me in the lobby. Go find Daniil, someone on staff. We pray for people in the back all the time before they're about ready to have surgery. It doesn't even matter. We want to be a place where you're transparent in the things that you want prayed over. If transparency can shift you toward healing, what's the risk of getting prayed over? And if you're lucky, we might even anoint you with oil. 
And if you're wondering, like, what does that mean? Let me tell you. So I've been waiting to tell this story since this church started. And I asked my wife, Kristen, can I tell this story? And she said, yes, you're supposed to always speak positively of your wife as the pastor. Well, not today. (laughs) So I just celebrated my seventh wedding anniversary. I was married for two weeks, end of October 2014. I was a youth pastor at a church in Peoria. Uh, We were transitioning out of that church, and we were going to help plant a church in Surprise. They bring Kristen and I up to the front to pray over us uh, as kind of like our send-off deal. So Kristen grew up in a Christian Reformed church. If you know anything about that, very denominational church. They were not whipping out the anointing oil at the church that she grew up in. My church, a little charismatic. That's how it worked. So we are standing up there, and this guy, Larry LaPrairie, he just passed away a couple months ago. He was the leader of the prayer team. Uh, I could see him get out of his seat, and he starts walking toward me as the pastor's like, well, Michael and Kristen are doing this, da-da-da-da-da. And Larry comes up to me, and I see he's got anointing oil in his hand. I knew exactly what he was going to do. My grandma led a prayer team. She always smelled like anointing oil. (laughs) So I say to my wife, I lean over to her, and it's like 300 people in the crowd, right? I'm like, Kristen, Larry's going to anoint you with oil. And she was like, no, he's not. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, he is. And she's like, that man better not touch me with that oil. And so I've been married two weeks, okay? Like, and one of those weeks we were on our honeymoon. I lean over to her, I'm like, Kristen, if you do like one thing for me in our entire marriage, just let him anoint you with oil. And she's like, again, if that man comes near me with that oil, there's going to be a problem. So they start to pray. And I'm like, I have no clue what to do. My wife's going to throw hands at Larry, who's old, runs the prayer team. So I'm sitting there trying to think quickly on my feet. And I'm like, are you 100% sure? She goes, yes, I'm 100% sure. So I'm like, I got to be a good husband. I lean forward and I, I whisper in Larry's ear. I go, she's deathly allergic to oil. So then I leaned over to her. I go, I just lied in the middle of church to try to save our two-week-old marriage. She thought he was going to break oil, like a jar of oil, like the the prostitute I talked about last week, over her head. I'm like, he's just going to dot your head. It's okay. And here's the deal. For those of you that are like my wife and you think anointing oil is foreign, anointing oil, there's not magic powers. When James is saying, like, let the elders of the church come, pray over you, anoint your head with oil, it's not like voodoo, where if we put oil on your head, like, magically things are going to happen. It's not medicinal purposes. So I know a lot of you are, like, essential oil people. God bless you. It's not what anointing oil is. It's a way to anoint somebody's head with oil, consecrate them before the Lord, symbolically cry out before the Lord, like, this is the person that we are praying for, God. Would you heal this person? So this is serious prayer. This is serious prayer. This is serious levels of transparency that the men and women that James is speaking to go get prayer from the elders, and they are going to pray to heal you. So what does James say about the one who is sick? He says in verse 15, he says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. That prayer you ask for, the thing you're transparent with, the prayer that's offered by the elders of the church, that word for prayer is a fervent wish or petition. Notice the word fervent. A lot, of, a lot of ways secular people like to tell you if they get sick, hey, would you throw some good energy out in the air? I don't know what that means. Like, here, energy. Like, hopefully that happens. This is a fervent prayer and petition before the Lord of healing, a physical illness where we're asking God, heal this person. And it says that the prayer will save the one who is sick. And the word save here means literally to be made well, like a physical healing. Remember when Jesus heals the paralytic, he tells him, rise up your mat and walk. Get up, take up your bed and walk. That's exactly the same thing. And I know this really isn't our subject this morning, but this verse gets absolutely murdered in a lot of churches today. Because in essence, it misinterprets what this scripture looks like. In essence, this verse relates to our transparency with God, our vulnerability with God, casting your cares upon the Lord and letting him know what you're thinking. 
So when you read this verse, the natural question is, well, what if I go get, I'm physically sick, go get prayer for healing, but yet I'm never healed? Doesn't the scripture say that the prayer of faith will save them, it will make them well? Well, if someone isn't healed, did they not have enough faith? There's a lot of damaging ways this verse is taught in the church today where somebody who's physically sick goes and gets prayed to be healed. They don't get healed, and then they're told, well, you didn't have enough faith to make you well. That's false. And that's ultimately a vast misinterpretation of Scripture. What this Scripture boils down to is what you think about God. How high of a view of the sovereignty of God that you have. When we look at God, we understand God is sovereign over all things. He knows all things. He's in control of all things, and that he works all things out to accomplish his purposes. And in a case like this, where you pray for physical healing, faith is exercised. We just did a 12-week series on faith. You exercise faith when you're transparent before the Lord and ask for healing. But what happens is you're transparent before the Lord and others, and if he chooses not to heal you, you still have an understanding of God's sovereignty, that his perfect will is being accomplished in and through you if your prayers are not answered. It's like in the verse John 14, 14, when Jesus says, hey, ask anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus isn't saying just throw in Jesus' name I pray at the end of my prayers. And it's like a magic genie where everything you prayed for, I'm going to give it to you. It's saying pray in my name that my will will be accomplished. If that brings healing, great. If that doesn't bring healing, you have to trust that the sovereign God is still accomplishing his will. So it's transparency before the Lord, it's transparency in prayer before the leaders of the church, and now we get one level deeper, and now we get uncomfortable. Verse 16, James says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So you might be sitting there like, whoa, man, like, I confess my sins to the Lord, that's enough. He knows what I'm dealing with, right? It's hard enough for me. You're asking me to walk across the auditorium and get prayer. That's awkward. Now you're asking me to confess my sins to someone else. What is this? I believe confession of sin to other Christians is a mark of a healthy gospel-centered church and the mark of a healthy gospel-centered Christian. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we as men and women of God should walk around with this billboard on our body of like every sin we've ever committed so the whole entire world can see it. That's not helpful for you. That's not helpful for other people. You do not need to walk, your head, walk around with your head hanging in shame as a Christian. But here's what I think this means, is you should be an open book to an accountable, mature individual in your life. So the question is, why do we do this? Why should we confess our sins to one another? And in this, the best example I can think of is the contrast of light and darkness. In 1 John 1, 5, 115, it tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That means that as his children, we are children of light. We are not children of darkness. What's darkness? It's concealment. It's hiddenness. It's secrecy. It's hypocrisy. What does light do? It shines on dark things. So to be clear, if you're a Christian, your sins have been forgiven. Your past sins, your current sins, and your future sins have been forgiven. They've all been taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So the question is, why should I confess things before God and before others? And the answer to that is because confession of sin drags the sin into light, and it takes that sin out of isolation. One of the best books I've ever read in my life is called Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In it, he has this quote. He says, Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more extractive will be the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. So if you're a Christian in this room and your sins have been forgiven, you still can walk according to the flesh. You're not perfect. You still can struggle with sin, whether that's sins of omission or commission. I was in a discipleship group last year, all of 2020. We met once a month and we had prayer partners that we were supposed to meet with a couple times a month. There were eight guys in this discipleship group. And we had to do one of the month's challenges we had to do was a temptation journal where all month, any time that we felt we were being tempted, we had to write that down in a journal. And then the next month's meeting, we had to like read our journal out loud. 
So it finally gets, and I'm guessing a bunch of dudes are going to walk into this room and their hands are going to be all sweating. And all eight guys read their temptation journal. And it was amazing to me. Not one guy in that room was tempted with any sort of sexual temptation, whether it be a simple wandering of the eyes, uh, looking at pornography, emotional affairs, or a downright marital infidelity. Not one of the eight guys struggled with that. So the odds to me were either one of two things. Either number one, we have a really solid eight group of guys who just simply defy every single statistic out there about sexual temptation, Or number two, we have some guys that after eight months meeting as a group, we're having a really rough time still opening up to each other. And that's typical because of the Bonhoeffer quote. It's easy to be in isolation. It's easy to do things in darkness. And it's easy for the remote parts of our lives to continue to be hidden. So what's the text tell us in James? Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Healed from what? Healed from sickness, things that make you unhealthy, whether those are physical, physical or spiritual. Then the text goes on to say that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Then goes on in verses 17 and 18 to give an example of Elijah. James says, Elijah was a man like, with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And we don't have time to cover this story in detail this morning. It's in 1 Kings 17 and 18. But you have Elijah, who's a prophet of Israel. And God told him that a drought would afflict the land of Israel to punish not just King Ahab, but also the Israelites in the midst of their idolatry. So what did Elijah do? According to James, he prayed for a drought to happen, and a drought came, and a drought was there and dried up the land for three and a half years. Then what did he do next? He prayed for it to rain, and it rained. Elijah had transparency before God. He had faith before God, and God answered his prayer. So the question is, this is a really random thing. If you know the book of James, all of a sudden James randomly throws this prophet Elijah story in there for two verses. Why is that happening? I think it's because there's a real example. What happens to a land when a drought happens? It kills the land. If I want to kill the grass in my front yard, I just won't water it, and the grass will die, right? The land is dead. What brings the land back to life? Rain. You have a contrast here between death and life. You have a contrast here between sickness and health. And you have a contrast between dryness and fruitfulness. We, as men and women of God, as Christians, are called to bear fruit. We're called to walk according to the Spirit of God, not according to the flesh. But when we walk according to the Spirit of God, we're called to bear fruit. So this morning, we have to ask ourselves, Am I bearing fruit or is sin choking all that fruit out of you right now in your life? I'll never forget, I think it was the second time I preached at Desert Springs. I went over to the side of the auditorium to pray with people after I was done and I had a woman come up to me and she said to me, uh, hey, uh, I really just want to get some stuff off my chest. Would you pray with me? And I said, sure. And she says to me, I've been married for 35 years, but for the last 15 years I've been unfaithful to my husband. And I was like, okay. And she's like, and nobody knows this. And so as she's telling me this, I could just see like this weight of like these things coming out of her mouth, like all the brokenness, the burden, the hiding, the emotion that was coming out when she was talking to me, the way that she, pro- the way that she cried when I got to pray over her. It was like years and years and years of secrecy finally coming to the light. And she wouldn't give me her name. She said she was from out of town. She asked me, well, what do you suggest I do? And here I am. It's my second time preaching. I had been on staff at a church for like two months. I was like, well, you need to go tell your husband. And she just kind of looked at me, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a firm believer that that stuff needs to be dragged into the light. And she said, well, he's standing right over there. And I go, well, you need to tell him. She goes, I think I'm going to tell him later today. And she walked off, and I haven't seen her since. And I went home that day, and I was watching golf. And it just hit me, the weight of the job that I have. And I told this woman to go confess 15 years of marital infidelity to her husband. And I'm sitting there watching golf where she was probably in her living room having a really, really bad afternoon. I said at the very beginning of this sermon, this is a difficult topic. There are some of you in this room with unconfessed sins in this place that if you were to confess those things, it could disrupt your marriage. 
it could disqualify you from doing the work of the ministry. If anything, some of you have been walking with things in your life that are hidden sin for months and years, and it's eating away at you personally, but more importantly, it's eating away at who you are in Jesus Christ. So you walk in here on Sundays, and you walk with a limp, and you don't need to. So here's my challenge for you this morning. Find someone in your life that you can trust and be transparent with that person. One of my favorite pastors to listen to is Matt Chandler. He says all the time, to be 99% known is to be fully unknown. If you come to me and you want marital counseling and I only know 90% of the problems in your marriage and you refuse to reveal to me the other 10% of the issues in your marriage, I can only counsel you on the 90% that I actually know. You're actually completely unknown in that situation. So find someone who can completely know you, that you can call in the midst of temptation, that if you told that person the deepest, darkest secrets of your life, it would be met with the things we talked about last week, love and grace. If the church isn't a safe place, where is a safe place going to be found? James finishes up in verses 19 and 20. He says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I'll finish with this. Salt, salt Church needs to be a safe place. It needs to be a safe place for the broken, and it needs to be a safe place where we act both individually and corporately as safe people. Notice what verse 20 says. It says, The person's soul will be saved from death, and a multitude of sins would be covered. The church should be a safe place because as a sinner, you need to understand that your sins have been covered. You're free in Christ. You're righteous before Christ. There's freedom in this room because of what Christ did on the cross. What I'm speaking about this morning is the battle that happens with sin when we operate according to the flesh. And if we are not careful to drag that sin into the light and to slay that sin, that sin can choke you out. Not meaning you'll lose your salvation, but instead that sin can actively weigh you down. It can hold you back from walking in freedom and running the race of Jesus Christ to win. So my question this morning is, what's holding you back from fully walking in freedom? Before this church started, I pled with the Lord. I Probably my biggest prayer before Salt Church started, I was like, God, please do not have this church be a bunch of 30-year-olds. I wanted men and women who could come here who were either age mature or spiritually mature because my vision of this church is where the older can disciple the younger. The spiritually mature can disciple the spiritually immature. And I can say this right now that I fully believe that there are men and women in this church that God's brought the right people. So when I say go find someone that you could confess sin to, go find someone that you can be transparent.